Good morning, Pursuit Church. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. Will you please stand with us as we sing some songs of praise? We're going to celebrate and we're going to worship God today. Are you ready? All right, let's do this. You guys can go ahead and take a seat for just a quick minute. I want to remind you of a few things before we jump into more worship, into our message, our series today. So glad that you are here. To those of you joining with us online, we're so glad that you are here as well. Today is an exciting day. It's a special day, and uh, we won't get into that too much yet, uh, but I want to remind you guys of a couple things. Number one, in the seat back in front of you, there is a card. If you're on the front row, you can steal it from the people behind you. Just reach and grab it. Uh, we would love to be able to connect with you, so I would encourage you to take a few seconds and fill that thing out. Uh, a couple things on that card. Uh, number one, on the back side of that card, there is a place where you can circle that says, I would like more information about the next Starting Point Cafe. 
What is Starting Point Cafe? Well, I'm so glad that you guys asked. Starting Point Cafe, if you are new to Pursuit Church and you would like to learn a little bit more about who we are, what we're all about, how you can be more involved, that is for you. And it's scheduled to happen next Sunday morning immediately following this service, our 1045 worship gathering, and there's free lunch involved, but we're not going to order the free lunch. And remember, it's not for people who have been here for a long time. We always have a few of those that are like, free lunch, let's do it. It's if you are new to Pursuit Church and like some more information about who we are, what we're all about. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure we've got enough food ordered. So uh, here's the deal. If you definitely want to be a part of it, take out that connection card. I see you all doing it. Great. And take a second, circle that thing so that we know that you want to be here or at least would like some more information about it. Also, on that connection card, if you've got a prayer request or would like any more info about any of that stuff, make sure you circle anything on there. Also want to remind you, uh, if you'd like to give of your tithes and offerings to Pursuit Church, we don't have a basket that comes around. Instead, if you're here in the room with us, there is a basket located in the back of the room that you can stick uh, checks and cash in. If you're joining with us online or you're here in the room, maybe the easiest thing is just to go to PursuitChurch.life and you can give, uh, click on the give button and make your easy, secure donation that way. But I would encourage you uh, to support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. And one more thing that I want to tell you guys about. On June the 5th, what was that date again? June the 5th, immediately following our 1045 worship gathering, we are going to have what we call our end of year celebration. A few people are excited about it. Okay. And what we're going to do at that celebration is, number one, we're going to have free food, and this time it's for everybody. And it's going to be good food. And if you call Pursuit Church home or you want, uh, want to even just come and see what we're all about, this is for you. We're going to have food. We're going to have uh, a, a time where we just kind of look back at the year that was. And by the way, our church year ends on May 31st, just to confuse everybody. And so if you want to know anything, that just kind of look back on what has happened in the year previous. Did anything crazy happen around here the previous year? Feels like something may have changed a little bit along the way. And uh, secondly, we're going to kind of look at, you know, church leadership, finances, all that kind of business stuff. And then finally, we're going to look, and this will be the main portion of it, we're going to look to the year ahead for what we believe God has for us in the coming year. So excited about it. Mark your calendars for June the... Uh, Fifth, good. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much just for the opportunity that we have to be here, to be able to, to meet with you. And God, I pray that you would help us today to be able to lay aside distractions. God, it would be so easy to focus our hearts on so many things that are going on in the world, in our lives, work, family, home, all that stuff. But God, I pray that in the next moments that we have together today, that we would focus our hearts completely upon you. God, that you would help us to experience your presence. God, that as we open your word together, that you would speak and that you would bring us near to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us. We're going to continue to sing and worship today.
speak Jesus. You want to sing this old hymn together that just says, Great is thy faithfulness. Let's sing that out together. Sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Lift it up.
thank you guys so much for singing with us. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. everybody. So glad that you guys are here with us today. Those of you joining online, glad you're here as well. Uh, today we are starting a brand new series called Practicing the Ways of Jesus. And I can't tell you how excited I am about this series. And here's the deal. I believe that this series has enormous potential to do incredible things in your life. It, it has enormous potential to enhance your relationship with Jesus. I, I've heard a famous pastor one time say that uh, following Jesus will make life better, not always easier, but make life better and make you better at life. Does anybody want life to be better and for you to be better at life? Okay, some of you need to be better at life is what I'm hearing. So with that said, this series is for you. We're going to talk about what it means to really follow Jesus, to practice his ways, and it has enormous potential to break strongholds of sin in your life. It has enormous potential to bring healing to relationships, to bring restoration and redemption. But here's the deal. It only has that potential. You have to lean into it. You have to listen in, and you have to let it change, and it may even require some change, some discipline, some things in your life that we don't like to do, but I promise you, if you do, it's going to do incredible things for you, because this series is not church as usual. This series is going to be very different, and, and I know that we've got this saying in the South. Well, we've got a lot of sayings in the South. We've got things like, bless your heart, which doesn't mean anything good. Hold your horses, right? Uh, matter than a wet hen, whatever that is all about. Uh, somebody came up to me after church today and was like, you forgot one. And they said, make sure you talk about some, something about um, eating corn through a picket fence, which apparently means you've got bad teeth, which I wasn't going to say, but they compelled me to do it. So, um, and uh, another one that really, really, my like personal least favorite is when somebody asks how you're doing and somebody responds, well, I'm finer than a frog hair split four ways. Don't laugh at that. That's the reason that the rest of the country makes fun of us in movies and stuff. We got to stop that stuff. So another one of these southern isms that we've got to get past is where do you go to church? Well, what church do you go to? And it seems like everybody's got one they go to, whether they go to it or not. And I don't want this series to be church as normal. This is going to be a series about learning what it means not to go to church, to be a part of a church, or even be engaged in a church. But this is a series about what it means to really learn to follow Jesus. And we're going to look at a couple different aspects of this. Number one, we're going to talk about the practices of Jesus. Everybody say practices. And what I love, there's this really cool verse at the end of Jesus' most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, where he says this, it's Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. In other words, he looked at all those people and said, it doesn't matter that you just know it, you've got to put it into, practice. and it doesn't even matter that you just believe it, you've got to put it into practice. You've got to put it into practice. So we're going to look at some of the practices of Jesus and see how we can live them out in our lives as well. And then the other thing is we're going to look at some of Jesus's priorities. Everybody say priorities. 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 This is a big deal because if you can look back to the state of your life and you can really determine where you are based on the priorities that you've had in your life. And so we're going to try to prioritize our lives the way that Jesus prioritized his life. Practices priorities. And I believe that if we do this, and I would love for you to commit to this seven-week series, I would love for you to plan to be here, be a part of it, so that you can learn how to really follow Jesus. So if we're going to look at Jesus' practices, we're going to look at Jesus' uh, priorities, maybe we should talk a little bit about Jesus. Who was Jesus? Son of God, okay, that's one person's uh, thought. And, and I think a lot of us would think of him that way. We think of him as the Son of God. Maybe you think about him as the Messiah, or you've heard the Christ. It's not really his last name. That's who he was. He was the long-awaited one of Israel who was going to come and save them and be their king. Maybe you think about him as the Savior of the world. Maybe you think about him as personal Savior. And all of those things is good. But if you were a first-century Jew living in northern Israel, you know what you would have thought of Jesus as? 
rabbi. You would have thought of him just as rabbi. He was a teacher. At the beginning of his ministry, that's how people knew him. You would go to the synagogue on Saturday and you would sit and listen under this rabbi. And let me tell you something, Jesus was a really awesome rabbi. He could teach and he could have people eating. He was like anti-status quo, anti-establishment, right? He would often rail on things about all this stuff. It was, it was absolutely amazing. And he had them eating out of the palm of his hands. And so everybody knew him as rabbi. And the fact that they knew him as rabbi has enormous implications for us today as to what it meant for them, first of all, to follow him in the first century, but it still has enormous implications for us today about what it means for us to follow him in the 21st century. Now, this, we, we keep throwing this term out, this idea of following Jesus. I, I want to make sure we understand what I'm talking about. I, I was reminded earlier, uh, well, on Friday night, I was at soccer practice. It wasn't my soccer practice. I would be in a cast if I was at soccer practice, but my kids' soccer practice. And I saw this, this one couple, they had an older kid playing soccer, and they had a little toddler, like an 18-month-old. And this toddler would run away from the soccer field, and they would chase the toddler down, and they would pick them up, put them on their shoulder, carry them back as the toddler screams. Any parents ever been there before? They did this like five times in a row. And then all of a sudden, they did what every parent eventually does in that moment. They gave up. And they decided, you be in charge now. You tell me where we're going. And then they proceeded to follow that kid all around the fields, everywhere that that kid wanted to go. And I thought to myself, I remember those days, and you may remember those days if you had little kids. And I remember thinking to myself, you've got to stay on that toddler, like, from that moment forward. If you look away even for a few seconds, what does that toddler do? Something dangerous. They get to the road, they get to a lake, they get to a hornet's nest. Something happens inevitably. You have to constantly be following that kid. I believe the same is true about Jesus, but listen, here's the deal. In our culture, what we've made following is like we're, we're really good at things like Instagram. We're really good at things like YouTube and, and Facebook and Twitter, and you can just click follow, and all of a sudden you're following, and then you can just throw your phone down and not even care. And I think that sometimes that's how we treat following Jesus. It's like, okay, I'll show up on Sunday and I'll say I'm following Jesus, but that's not what following Jesus is. It's like following a toddler that wants to lead the way. It's constant. It never stops. You have to constantly be following Jesus. And that's what we're going to learn about in this series. And so just to give us a, a little bit better context for the first century, specifically about what it meant to follow Jesus, I want us to read some passages together. If you have your Bible, you can flip to Mark. If you don't, that's okay. It's going to be up on the screen behind me. But we're going to actually read from Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 8. <laughs> what are you guys doing? All right. It says this, Mark chapter 1. It says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people, or I will make you fishers of men, is the famous phrase there. And at once they left their nets, and they followed him. And when they had gone a little far, farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. They left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. And what did they do? Followed they followed him. Flip over to Mark chapter 2. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. And he said, follow, follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up. And what did he do? followed him. Mark chapter 3, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. I love that terminology. And they came to him. They, in other words, they decided they were going to follow him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave the name Good, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then flip over to Mark chapter 8. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and what? Amen. More on that verse in a few weeks. But for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. 
But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or who can give, who can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So these are some people in the first century who followed Jesus. It, it seems kind of like they just laid down whatever they were doing and decided, hey, I got a fishing career, but instead I'm going to go and follow Jesus around. Or, hey, I've got a tax collecting career, but instead I'm going to just go and follow Jesus around. But see, they had a context about following Jesus in the first century that we don't quite have yet. We're going to learn about it today. You see, what happens typically when you were living in the first century is that there were a lot of rabbis. Jesus was not the only rabbi, and the rabbis had students. Rabbis had followers. Rabbis had disciples. And when you had one disciple, it was called a Talmud. But when you had a group of disciples, it was called a Talmudim. You've learned your first Hebrew word of the day. Congratulations, you're becoming experts. Talmudim. And when you had a Talmudim, you, they followed you. They studied under you. And, you know, we can translate this word into English as disciples, but that doesn't quite do the trick. We can translate it as followers, but that really doesn't do the trick. And we can translate it as students, but maybe the best way that we could translate this word is, is like this, an apprentice. A Talmud, or to be a part of a Talmudim, mean that, means that you were apprenticing under a rabbi. Jesus was not the only rabbi to have disciples or apprentices. All dis, all, almost all the rabbis did. Matter of fact, there was a famous rabbi named Hillel just before Jesus showed up on the scene. He had 70 disciples. Jesus only had 12 official ones, right? And so Jesus... Literally, when he showed up to call his disciples, he told them, I want you to come and be a part of my Taliban. Taliban. Somebody said Taliban. No, <laughs> not that. Talmudim. There we go. <laughs> I made this too dangerous. That's awesome. Talmudim. And so let me give you a little bit of context to make sure you understand how this would work. You would start as a young Jewish person, and you would go to a school called this, Beit Sefer. Everybody say Beit Sefer. Beit. Now you know three Hebrew words. You're going to have a lot to talk about tomorrow at work at the water cooler. It's going to be great. And this was kind of like you would consider it elementary school, where you would learn to read and to write, and you would learn maybe some basic math, but you did it all from the Old Testament. Every single bit of this was like from the Torah, from the prophets. You would learn it all. And your goal was to read it so much that you would have like the first five books of the Bible memorized by the time you were 12 years old. Have you ever read through the first five books of the Bible? Could you imagine having them memorized by the time you were 70? How about 12? And so usually they wouldn't make it, but if, 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 listen, here's the deal. If you didn't quite add up academically, usually most everybody at this point would just go home and they would be done with academic, academics. If you were a girl, you would go home and help around the house and wait till you got married, and that was typically at a pretty young age. If you were a boy, you would go home and you would start helping with the family business. Help your dad be a fisherman, a farmer, run the local Chick-fil-A, whatever it was. Then... You would go on, though, if you were really, really good at the academia stuff, you would go on to a second level of school, which is called Beit Talmud. Everybody say Beit Talmud. Beit Talmud. Yeah, this is literally translated like house of learning, house of the book. And you would go, and there was a, usually a building really close to the synagogue in whatever town you were in, and you would go learn how to be a disciple, how to be a rabbi. You would memorize large sections of the Old Testament, begin thinking through other rabbis and what their yoke is. A rabbi's yoke was his particular set of teaching. So you would analyze all this. You would memorize large parts of the Old Testament. And usually at this point, when you finish that, you were done being a student and you would go work. But sometimes a rabbi at that point would interview you. They would ask you some questions and they would say, okay, let me ask you some questions about the Old Testament. Let me ask you some questions about my teaching. Let me ask you some questions about other rabbis teaching. Let me know what your favorite college football team is. Do you like New York style or Chicago style pizza better? And if you answered all the questions appropriately, they may say something to you like this. Come follow me. Come and be a part of my, not Taliban, but Talmudim. The internet's going to flag this. You're not going to be able to see it online because we use that word. But anyway, Talmudim, come and be a part of my 
followers, my apprentices. And so when literally when Jesus showed up to talk to Peter and to Andrew and to John and these people, he wasn't saying to them, hey, I want you to just leave the nets and come follow me and see where I go. He was saying, I want you to come and be a student, an apprentice under me. And they said, you mean I don't have to do a, a hard life of manual labor here for the rest of my life? I can come apprentice under one of the greatest rabbis I've ever heard? Yeah, I'll come and be your apprentice, Jesus. And they set out to do that. And if you were an apprentice of a first century rabbi, you had three goals. Goal number one was this. You want to be with your rabbi. Everybody say, be with your rabbi. You wanted to be with him. Everywhere he went, when I say you wanted to be with him, I mean you wanted to be with him. You slept beside him. You ate with him. You went everywhere he goes. You were with your rabbi. There was a common phrase that came out of the first century that said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And I want you to think, they were in desert communities. That was not metaphorical. That was literal. Be so close that you are covered in the dust of your rabbi, if you are his apprentice. First goal was to be with him. Second goal, if you were an apprentice, was to become like your rabbi. You wanted to become just like him in almost every way. Now, they would have had a context for this in the first century, but, you know, all that, that phrase that we just read a few minutes ago, where Jesus showed up to the, the fishermen and said, hey, I'm going to make you fishers of men, you know, Sometimes we read that and we kind of think that it's kind of this corny joke that Jesus made. Like, hey, I see you're fishing for people, but if you come with me, you'll fish for men. I think Jesus was way funnier than that. I don't think he was that corny. An actual phrase from the first century would have been a fisher of men. And it referred to a rabbi who could capture the hearts and imaginations of all the people around them. They could start talking and everybody would just show up. Jesus was considered a fisher of men. And so when he told Peter, hey, if you come with me, I will make you a fisher of men. He was saying, come with me and I will help you to become just like me. You'll be able to capture the hearts and the imaginations of people when you speak as well. And I've often wondered if Peter remembered that moment when he stood up in Jerusalem, like almost four years later, and he talked to thousands of people and they hung on every word he said. He was like, wow, Jesus, he was actually right. He made me a fisher of men. The goal was to become just like your rabbi. Now, listen, I get that we live in a culture of self-expression, and we are all think that we're individuals and snowflakes, and everybody's unique. I get that. But that was not the way it was in the first century. Your goal was to become just like your rabbi. Third goal was to do what your rabbi did. That's a little bit different than to become like your rabbi. That means if your rabbi was out teaching, guess what you were doing? Out teaching. If your rabbi went to dinner, guess what you did? You went to dinner too. You did what he did. If he studied at nine, from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock in the morning, guess when you studied? 9 to 11, because you did what your rabbi did. Now, here's the implications for us. Let's, let's transform this from the first century discipleship model to a 21st century discipleship model. What would it look like for you if you decided today, you know what, I want my goals to be the exact same goals that the Talmudim of Jesus had in the first century. I want my goals to be with my rabbi, to be with Jesus. I want my goal to be to become like Jesus. I want my goal to be to do what he did. What if you set your life's agenda based on those goals right now in the 21st century? What would happen? Well, since you didn't answer, I'll tell you what would happen. Let's start with the first one. What if you made your goal to be with your rabbi all the time? See, they, they had a context for this, but there's this really cool moment that happened in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus had called his disciples, and then they lost him. Like, so, so Jesus had shown up on the scene to this city, and he had taught in the synagogue all morning, and then he went home later that afternoon, and Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and he healed her. And I got to tell you, as a pastor, that's a really good day. If you can, like, preach all morning, go heal somebody, you think you're pretty much done, right? And you're like, okay, I'm going to sit down and have a snack or three. We're good. But instead, word spread that Jesus was there and that he was healing people, and people started bringing sick and demon-possessed people. And it says that he healed and cast out demons until after the sun went down. He was late at night. He was tired. But then it says that he got up early the next morning and left the disciples where they were, and he went by himself to a place to pray. So picture this. Jesus gets up in the morning, heads off to Starbucks to get his drink, and heads over to the Sea of Galilee. By the way, real quick, what would Jesus order if he went to Starbucks? There's a specific answer, and the answer is 
not a pumpkin spice latte because he never sinned. So <laughs> Jesus heads over, gets his drink, and then he goes, and the disciples wake up, and they're panicking. They're furious. Check this out in Mark chapter 1. It says this. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions woke up. They went to look for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Now, why is everyone looking for him? Because they were supposed to be with him all the time, and they couldn't find him. So can you just imagine the panic? Peter wakes up. John, where is Jesus? You were supposed to be watching him. No, my watch ended at 2. Thomas, you were supposed to be watching him. Thomas is like, sorry, I fell asleep. And John's like, uh-huh, you wait till you see what I write about you in 30 years, Mr. <laughs> Doubter, right? And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it, it, they panic, and they go looking for him, and they find him, and they say, Jesus, where were you? You were supposed to take us with you, because they didn't want to miss anything, because if they missed a moment with Jesus, they could have missed everything. What if you had the same heart, and I had the same heart about being with Jesus that they did? Jesus, I don't want to miss a moment with you, I don't want to miss anything that you have for me. That means my, my heart, my soul, I have to be constantly centered on you. And I, I can already hear your objection right now. You're like, but Jesus isn't here. I don't see him. Well, Jesus actually had a plan for that. He told his disciples, his apprentices, that he had a plan for that. And the plan was found in, Act, in uh, John chapter 14 when he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, listen, there's going to be, I'm going to have to leave, but I'm going to send another version of me that's kind of like me, not me, but it is me, and it's going to live inside of you. It got really weird really quick. This is the way that he said it in John chapter 14. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all kinds of things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In other words, even if I leave, you're going to have the presence of God in your life. Now, this is a game-changing thought. And I want you to really hear it. That in order to have your goal be to be with Jesus every step of the way, what that means, what that looks like for you, is that you are going to be constantly connected to and aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. In every step of the way. That means when you get up in the morning, guess what? You are constantly connected to and aware of the Spirit's presence in your life. When you go to work and you're standing beside that water cooler telling them about all the cool Hebrew words you learned, you are aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. They didn't laugh at that joke in first service either. I should have thrown it out. <laughs> when you go home and you're with your family, you're with your friends, wherever you go, you are constantly aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. That is a game-changing thought, and if you put it into practice, it changes everything. Your goal should be to be with Jesus. Second goal is this, to become like Jesus, to become like your rabbi. There's this really cool parable. It's actually one of the shortest parables that Jesus ever told. Uh, he's kind of getting on to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law a little bit. He says, he also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? The answer is, no, no, it doesn't work so well. Because, will they both not fall into a pit? And the answer is, yes, they would. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. In other words, Jesus says, you're Pharisees, you are leading. You're leading, you're like the blind leading the blind. And you're leading people the wrong way. You're teaching them the wrong things. And they're becoming just like you. And he also makes mention of a partially or a fully trained student, which also lets us know that there are partially trained students and wrongly trained students. And here's the deal. The, the reality is us becoming more like Jesus, this is a really hard thing. You know why it's hard? Because it requires change. It requires transformation. Like there's a gap between who you are and who Jesus is. Let's be more realistic, right? There's a big gap 
between who you are and who Jesus is. And, and in order for us to fill this gap, that's what apprenticeship does, but it means that we have to be changed and transformed. As a matter of fact, this is the way that Paul says that it has to happen. And we, this is 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That word transformed, the, the Greek word is metamorpho. You guys are learning all kinds of great things today. That's literally a metamorpho morphosis that has to happen in you. How does that happen? There are two things. Number one, the power of God at work in you. You can't do it by yourself under your own power ever. There's a power of the Holy Spirit at work in you. That's number one. Number two is, have you ever noticed that the more time you spend in a place or with a person or with a group of people, that you become more like that place? Like, for example, a, a few years ago, my wife and I took a trip to New York City for about three or four days. And I remember being so nervous about driving in Manhattan. See, I grew up driving on the metropolis streets of Chickamauga, Georgia, which was a little bit different than Manhattan. And, and so I remember driving the very first day. I was nervous about getting in there, and I pull in. And all of a sudden, there's like I'm at a traffic light. It's red. There are people walking in front of me. And all of a sudden, the light turns green. The people are still there, but the guy behind, behind me starts laying on his horn and yelling out his window, Go! What are you doing? And I was like, I'm avoiding a felony and spending my life in prison more than anything. Like, I can't run people over. And I, I got to our parking garage. I was like, I never want to drive here again, ever. And I spent four days walking around the city, seeing this, hearing this happen. And I decided that what I was going to do is when I got out of this city now, I kind of like this, this busy lifestyle. I'm going to do the same thing on our way out. And so, like, I promise you, got up to that first red light. The light turns green. There's somebody in front of me. I just laid on the horn as loud as I could. Why? Because I'd been there four days and I had become like that place. Now, that's a silly example. But when you spend time in a place, you become like that place. When you spend time with people, you start to become like those people. If you're not becoming like Jesus in your life, it's because you're not spending time with him. If you're not becoming like Jesus in your life, it's because you're not spending time in his word. You're not spending time in prayer. You're not spending time in worship. You're not spending time in his church. That's the way that it is. And so if you want to be changed in your life and become more like Jesus to be a real follower of his, you've got to spend time with him. There's a power that comes to you that's only available through the Holy Spirit, and you've got to spend time in it. And then number three, finally this. You've got to do what your rabbi did. What did Jesus did? Well, he... That's great. What did he do? He, well, he prayed... He fasted, he studied, he rested, he called out the Pharisees, he cast out demons, he healed the sick, raised the dead, he taught, he ate with sinners, he empowered his Talmudim, he sent them out. Now, what if you put into practice in your life doing what Jesus did? I would encourage you to not start with casting out demons, although you may know a few, but what if you... <laughs> What if you said, you know what, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to start praying like Jesus prayed. I'm going to start studying like Jesus studied. And I, I, I'm going to start eating with sinners like Jesus ate with sinners. And you don't need to call that out when you're eating with sinners, right? <laughs> don't be like, my pastor told me to find evil people. I invited you over. Don't, that, <laughs> don't start there. Don't start there. But what if you just started doing what Jesus did? Jesus saw this as the plan, the pattern from the beginning. Matter of fact, this is what he told his disciples. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Next verse is in chapter 10, but it's the same thought. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, who did some crazy things in the present while he was with Jesus. Jesus, right? And his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, which if you guys know what a zealot was in the first century, it was a person who took any chance they could get to kill a Roman soldier. They were zealous about getting Israel back to where it was, and they tried to find opportunities. You think he and Matthew, the tax collector for Rome, had some interesting conversations? Yeah, that was great. He had a horrible past. And Judas Iscariot, do you think he had a horrible future ahead of him? Who betrayed him? These 12, Jesus sent out 
with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of these Samaritans, not because Jesus wasn't ready to serve them, but because they weren't ready to. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, and as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely have you have received, freely give. In other words, he said, you guys go, and don't tell me that you have an excuse, because in the Jesus' midst, he had a guy with a terrible past, a terrible present, and a terrible future, and Jesus said, go and be like me and do what I did. So what if you made your goal today as a follower of Jesus, a real follower of Jesus? I want to be with him. I want to become like him, and I want to do what he did. What if you set that as your mission today? How would your life change? I want to give you an example of how your life would change. I've invited somebody to come up and share their story about how their life changed when they decided this very thing. So if you guys would join me in welcoming Sissy to the stage. Everybody say good morning, Sissy. And she's going to tell you her story about this very thing. So listen intently. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sissy, and um, I've been coming to Pursuit for a little over a year now. And Josh asked me to come up and speak today. <clears throat> um, I remember going to church as a little girl and hearing all the stories from Sunday school and vacation Bible school. So I knew who God was and who Jesus was, the creator of the world, the son of God. Um, as a teenager, going to church with friends and hearing those same stories, the meaning of who God and who Jesus was became more profound God was a sovereign God who loved us so much he sent his son to die for us. And Jesus was the Savior. He was so pure and so blameless that he gave his life for us. At 15, uh, I asked Jesus into my life and became saved. As an adult, I knew something was missing. Um, my family and I, we did not have a church home. Uh, and I knew we needed one, but not because as a Christian you're supposed to go to church, but we weren't hearing God's word. And I knew that I was personally missing a relationship with Jesus. Um, see, I'd always known who God and Jesus were, but I didn't have a relationship with them. I didn't know them personally. Uh, so I decided not to rely on church, not to rely on a pastor to give me God's word. I decided I was going to read the Bible myself, start to finish, cover to cover. And um, that was not fun, and I failed. Um, I'd get started, and I'd get into Genesis, and all of the who begat who begat who th <laughs> threw me. And I would stop reading, um, and I'd try again, and I'd get a little further each time, and I'd make it through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, but then I'd get really confused again, and I would just stop. So the Bible was a foreign language to me. Um, but my relationship with God was always at beginner status. It never really moved on from that. Um, one day I was flipping through radio stations, driving down the road, and I heard a catchy song and the, the lyrics, the words, they really resonated with me. It was something that was going on in my life at that moment. And the radio station was K-Love, and I'd never heard of a Christian station before. Um, but I decided to start listening daily, and I listen daily and still do. And um, it, it changed me. Um, the music changed me. And I noticed that the change in my music really changed my attitude for each day. It really... I became more positive and uh, more patient. But, uh, as we know, the world is a dark, dark place. It's very evil and sad all the time. And um, it can be overwhelming. And it's everywhere, everywhere you go. It's on social media, it's on the news, it's in the shows we watch and the books we read and certainly in the music that we listen to. <coughs> Um, and one day, a coworker pointed out to me that um, I was really letting all the negativity of this world bring me down. And um, I'd get really worked up about things that were out of my control. So I decided to cut it all out of my life. And I started to make little changes for myself. And I'd already changed the music that I listened to. Um, but then I changed the types of books 
that I was reading. And uh, then I'd stop focusing on all the bad. And uh, eventually the, year, the shows that I'd watched for years, all of a sudden I couldn't get through them anymore. I was cutting those out because they were horrible. And um, all these changes really affected me. And um, <clears throat> I became more positive. I was telling uh, the, first, the first service that my kids joke on me because um, I've cut out a lot of the TV that I watch. They know that if I'm sitting down and watching TV, it's going to be Hallmark or something like that because it's, uh, it's the same thing over and over. It's never bad, and it always has a happy ending, so that's what I like. Um, but these changes, I did notice, they were really affecting me, and um, they made a difference in how I took on each day, and, and I really do think for the better. Um, but while I was making these changes in my life, my relationship with Jesus was still minimal. Um, so I've prayed my whole life. I grew up, you know, around church, and I've prayed, and they're generic prayers, you know, um, but I was never really intentional with my prayers or very persistent. And um, I know that I needed to make that change. I needed daily reminders. So I would set reminders on my phone to pray at a certain time. Or I would even draw a cross on my hand every day at work so I could see it all day long. And, um, and I would just see it and I would feel, you know, Jesus there. And I even thought about getting a tattoo. I haven't done that yet for the cross, but um, <clears throat> I needed those reminders in my life, and um, eventually, instead of putting prayers off to the end of the day, or right before bed, or, um, you know, I, whenever I need, I knew that there was a need, I would pray right then, and I do that now, to this day, I pray right then, um, and this has really affected me really has affected my relationship with God, and I, uh, it, it's led me to just praising God and thanking God all the more, and I really began looking for the good in everybody and everything, and I want to see the light in everything, um, and this has changed me. It really has. It affects my relationship with my family and my friends, but even at work with my patients every single day. Um, <clears throat> I'm still not perfect. I'm horrible with, uh, getting frustrated and sometimes have a bad attitude and I get angry. Um, but I don't hang on to those feelings anymore. I don't dwell on the bad. And I try to take this with me in every aspect of my life. Um, and now my thoughts are just consumed with God and Jesus all the time. I mean, I wake up thinking about it, go to bed thinking about him when I'm eating, when I'm working. I just, I think about Jesus all the time. And um, my... My favorite verse is Matthew 5, 16, be the light. And um, I pray every day for God to use me. I pray for him to shine his light through me so that I can lead others to him, those who are lost or those who are in need. Um, and not for my sake, not for me, for my glory, but because I want everyone to know who Jesus is the love that he provides and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the healing that he provides. And I want everyone to know. Um, but I realize that uh, I can't truly guide anybody if I don't know the word, if I haven't read the word myself. So I made a resolve that I was going to read the whole Bible. And I'm still working on that. Um, I took some time, but I found a Bible study that um, it breaks the Bible down in chronological order, and I read it every day for 365 days, and at the end of those 365, I will have read the entire Bible, and um, I'm on day like 115, so I'm really excited, um, and even if I don't do the whole study for the day, I at least read the verses every day just so I have that habit of doing so. <clears throat> But at the end of that, I won't just have read the Bible, but I'll have a deeper understanding of who God is, of who Jesus is. Um, um, I recently saw a TikTok. It was a video of a girl uh, explaining something that her dad said to her. And he said, you can't stay a spiritual midget forever, kid. <laughs> and I thought that 
that's me. I've been a spiritual midget. That's what I've been. And I was like, it really hit me hard. And I was like, that's me. I have uh, really been feeling that God has a plan for me, that he has a direct path for me. But like I haven't been able to reach it. Like I haven't had full access to it. And I thought it's because I'm spiritually stunted. I can't, I'm here. I need to be here. Um, So I have been really making these, trying to make these changes in my life so that I can, I can access this path, this plan that he has for me because I want to spread the love of Jesus to everyone. Um, And that's, I want my relationship with Jesus to blossom, to grow. Um, And there is a, there's one thing that I haven't done and um, it's been really heavy on my heart for a while now. But my family and I have decided to do it together today, and we will all be baptized. Yeah. So there are a few things that she said in there that were just absolutely amazing. She talked about how she felt like she was still on beginner mode in her relationship with Jesus. And I feel like that that's probably how a lot of us feel sometimes. We're just at the beginning, but today's a day that I want to encourage you to take that next step to say, you know what, I really, really want to follow Jesus. And so I'm going to do this today. We're going to, we're going to close with this baptism, and I'm so excited about this. We're going to have them come on up, get ready. You guys can just line up. We'll, we'll go smallest to biggest right here. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited for several reasons that we get to do this today. Number one, we get to do it inside with our new baptism tank. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited that it's not cold. I'm excited that uh, I don't even have to get in and get wet. So this is a great day all the way around. And uh, you guys come on up. Yeah, well, maybe they're going to get changed even. So I pro- Oh, there they go. Now we're talking. Uh, so I- I'm excited. You guys uh, stay seated so everybody around you can see. But... Uh, we're going we're gonna to start with, with the littlest first here. You guys can climb on in. Okay, you're going first. Oh, you're getting in too. All right. Uh, yeah, hey, we spent a lot of time warming this up because we, you know, we care about people and those kind of things. Make sure it's warm. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and sit down. <laughs> it's better than it could be, I promise. All right, go ahead and sit right here on your bottom as best you can. Yep, go ahead and just sit all the way down. All the way down. There we go. Yep, there we go. All right, you can grab hold of this arm if you want to. Or you can, you don't, you don't have to. There we go. All right. Sadie, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Pow. Pow first. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and look at these really cool t-shirts that we've got now. Made new Pursuit Church. <laughs> Here you go. T-shirt, just for you. All right, you can go ahead and sit down. <laughs> Apparently, we should have ran the heaters all night long. <laughs> all right, there we go. You want to grab this arm with one hand? Plug your nose with the other hand. I see that that was a, a mistake we had before. All right, Lane, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Come on out. <laughs> and T-shirt for you. You thought it was going to be warm? It is warm. All right. Here we go. Sissy, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah! You get to go last. Now his reaction to the temperature of this will determine whether the rest of them are... uh, (laughs) (laughs) Feels warm from out here, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> there we go we'll make it quick all right Brandon we baptize you in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit yeah yeah and your shirt 
you can have it. So, an exciting day. Listen, if you've never been baptized and you would like more information about what that means, in that Connect card that you all filled out and are going to leave in your seat, circle that. But listen, here's the reality. Right now, we've got about 10 of these printed up. They say, Made New Pursuit Church. If by the end of this year, we haven't given out those 10 and on our way to 1,000, I'm so excited about what God's doing here. I want to give away a thousand of these shirts. I, I believe that God is going to do just incredible things here. And so invite, invite, invite. There's some new Connect cards outside in the front that's got the new times, 915 and 1045. I'm excited about this. Hey, I would encourage you to commit to being a part of this series that we're in. Uh, all seven Sundays of it, it's going to be exciting. If you want to learn about what it means to follow Jesus in the 21st century, this is for you. All right, have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys back next week at 915 or 1045. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>